Hello and welcome to B2B Revenue Leaders. I'm your host, Dustin Tizek. As always, this episode is brought to you by Testimonial Hero. Scaling your customer storytelling as a marketer is hard. You have a million things on your plate. It can quickly fall by the wayside. Testimony Hero exists to help you effortlessly scale your customer storytelling through video testimonials and written case studies. Learn more at testimonialhero.com. On this episode, I'm joined by Derek Gerber, who is the Director of Growth B2B at Power Digital Marketing. Derek has years of agency experience and has worked with many B2B companies over the years. So he's unpacking some of the common mistakes he's seen. We also talk about how to strategize and think through your advertising ecosystem and how you can't measure absolutely everything in marketing. Hey, Derek, welcome to the show. Hey, what's happening, man? Good to see you. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, thanks for joining me. It's an interesting episode here, I think, because I was, we were saying before we went on air, you've spent a lot of time working with a ton of different SaaS companies, and you've probably seen all the mistakes a company could possibly make. So I want to even just kick it off right there. What are some of the common mistakes that you see when you onboard a new SaaS company? Yeah, typically working within B2B SaaS specifically, some of the common mistakes that we've been finding lately are gaps within content strategy, gaps within paid media, planning strategy and execution, but then over abundance in focusing on over engineering solutions that pull back all the different layers of trying to understand where every single penny of every single ounce of time is invested and how it turns into a dollar. What I mean by that is when people get too far down into the weeds, they forget about the purpose of the marketing that they're creating in the first place. They're forgetting that they're talking to people who are not logical creatures, who are emotional creatures, who are looking to find alignment with the brands that they want to do business with, who want to feel good about the brands that they're choosing to work with, and are proud of those logos too. And so when we get into over-engineering ROI per specific campaign structure, or how we flip up a percentage or two when we're hands-on keyboards within those accounts. We want to make sure that we're not getting away from the overall data-driven holistic strategy that's going to drive all of the channels. And an omni-channel approach is still the best way to go about it. But sometimes people get way too focused on paid media and over-engineering those ROI results so that they can make a spreadsheet happy in the background. And then they turn off their ability to do more of the content strategy and the campaigns with true creative that really makes a difference. So keep that in mind is that if you know, you're in the B2B SaaS space, yes, being really good on your paid media strategy and tactics is very important, but the content and the strategy and the livelihood that comes out of those campaigns is going to be just as important. So having amazing creative and content and strategy and branding and story is going to be just as important as to finding the right channels for distribution. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, I'm curious, have you seen people be more granular and focused on where every dollar is spent going? And the reason I'm bringing this up is the economy has it better, a bit better now in some cases, but it's been a little shaky, right? People have been really cautious of where they're spending money. So do you think that's what's driving it? Or is it just, it used to be you could put $10 in AdWords and get $20 back and people are still living in that world? I would definitely say that over the last three to five years, the ad world has changed significantly. And there's been a lot of tools and MarTech release specifically that helps address attribution issues. And what we had found is that some teams were cut back in the last couple of years in order to make a little bit of headcount room. And we understand that. But marketing teams internally let go of key people who filled in gaps before thinking that technology could supplement their natural intelligence. And that holistic strategy that glues all of these different channels together has been lost a lot of the different times. And what I mean by that is that we get so wrapped up on the executive level presentation to the team when we say, I know specifically the ROI of this campaign and this dollar amount, but yet they still lack the proper fundamentals of implementing those tools that are supposed to show that attribution. They find out that those data sets never do match holistic platform data versus these new intent inspired data points and then also on the back end to are losing accountability across their strategy but then also executing on real world campaigns that refresh themselves all the time so high frequency high creativity has been subjected to the side if you would so that we could focus on our tools and then making them shine and those things are out of alignment with the expectations for success and what marketing needs to do to drive pipeline and revenue and that just diving in a little bit further to it in a, a constructive way because teams, you don't want to be too wrapped up around the axle trying to get too far down into the weeds to prove a point. There are many different omni-channel strategies that come together that support the buyer's journey. So just even here at Power, our incrementality testing will show you lift per piece of content created per channel per geo 
but you have to go through the process. You don't just shortcut your way there. There is a very in-depth process that goes into doing it and doing it right. So you could scale uh, at the world's largest brands, again, scale for the world's largest enterprise deals, but then also scale for the millions of users that you need to go capture right now. But don't lose track of that story, that process, and that relationship building along the way, just so you could get a couple KPI stats in the background. A lot of companies chase lower CPC, but then over uh, time basically hurt their ACV and their overall contract values. And so you don't just want to chase a couple of key metrics and KPIs and stats that you saw along the way, just back out and take another holistic view at the creative that's being developed, the channels in which it's being distributed, and then actually properly implementing a lot of those MarTech tools to give you the insights back because marketers have more data than ever, but the insights that we can action from that information has been lost. And so often at Power, we come in and help find those insights and establish that together. But again, if I could provide any helpful information out there to the audience, and if you're watching this, just make sure you don't get too wrapped up around the axle around that. And if you're struggling to get to those numbers, then give us a call. We'll help you out. Yeah, it's, it's funny because it's one of those things intuitively to, I'm very going to very oversimplify this, but you want to get good creative in front of the right people consistently is the short of it. And I, Interesting example, there's, at least for me, I have never been able to measure programmatic effectively whatsoever on a dollar to dollar basis, but you got to trust that you're putting out good creative to the right people and following them over the internet. So is that, do you have certain channels like that where you're like, I'm never going to be able to measure this effectively and you just focused on Lyft or what is the strategy there? Yeah, absolutely. I would say when working with B2B companies specifically around where we can confidently predict pipeline generation opportunities and measure ROI usually comes into a couple key stats of first touch, last touch, multi-touch, even self-reported attribution are common ways to address these things. But what I find often is that it usually has to match the company's culture and vision and expectations for success. And what I mean by that is that while we're all trying to generate revenue, how we go about it might change. How it works within your company might be different. The process in which we go about launching marketing campaigns might have a completely different workflow than another similar company. So I was to say, you don't want to say it depends all the time. There are definitely first touched moments where it's going to be more important to measure that type of effect. But then later on, maybe later in the funnel, last touch is definitely going to be important to measure the, the validity of specific content that's meant to create confidence and get people to close. And then of course, become your client for years to come. So our goal 100% is to make raving fans of the brand with the content that we create and then making sure that there's a lot of brand relevancy behind it. But who's measuring brand relevancy? Where does that number fall within your internal processes, right? So when you think about ROI, you think about creating value, you think about the headcount involved, you think about the marketing systems, your ad budget. I've watched some people say, I'm going to go crush it on Google ads and I'm going to spend two grand a month. And then somehow they think that's going to make $10 million for their company. When there's other companies spending millions of dollars a month on Google that make sure that you don't show up. So when it does come to doing it and doing it right, you have to make sure it's completely in line with your expectations for success, but then also ingrained within reality, if you would, as you still need a great marketing strategy and a campaign with great content that comes out and brings your brand to life. But again, don't get overly wrapped up around the axle of overly trying to prove out something because you'd actually be detrimental and hurt your business's growth. Yeah, and you, so you mentioned Google there, which to me, it's that's the one of the easier ones to measure, obviously, because it's usually, if you're doing it right, it's usually really high intent keywords and there's a shorter space between them clicking on that and buying. Whereas for us, like we run a lot of LinkedIn campaigns that I know I might not see the ROI right away. And six months later, someone will say, I saw you on LinkedIn. I don't remember where, but like you've been all over. We've seen you. So do you separate those two and think content wise, like I need lower funnel content here, or higher funnel over here. Like how do you actually map out that ad ecosystem? That's a great question. When it comes to mapping out ecosystems for your campaigns and measuring ROI most confidently, it's definitely going to change from platform to platform. So when you get into Google, we like to use Google for high intent keywords because it's easier to string those things together. I have something to do. We need to make sure we show up and dominate the SERP. It's all part of our game plan. So when you're doing paid search, paid display, programmatic, when it comes into those things for retargeting, you have to make sure you're having high touch, high frequency, but then also high rates of creative refresh along the way. 
when it comes into other platforms, maybe more specifically LinkedIn, I watch a number of B2B companies try to use LinkedIn to spray and pray everywhere. They think that they're supposed to be advertising to 500,000 people in their TAM on LinkedIn. But the truth is that is not true. You don't want to talk to 500,000 people. You probably don't want to talk to 50,000 of those people. You probably want to talk to 10 or 15 in some of those cases. And that may vary from business to business. So if you are a B2B company being very specific to you, it would not be the same as selling maybe jeans or high fashion uh, opportunities in the B2C world. Those worlds will definitely be different and they will change when you're in B2C and you're looking for that instant click, that instant buy, the buy now action. You're expecting a much shorter sales cycle within a couple minutes. So once you enter the enterprise world for B2B, sales cycles can take anywhere from 30 days, 60 days to nine to 12 months, 100%. Sometimes they can take 18 months if the deals are large enough. So when you get into it and you have to be able to measure these things over longer periods of time, again, it might be a little bit easier on some upfront KPIs and metrics, especially for platforms like Google, when you're feeling in those moments and you're trying to measure uh, stickiness towards your campaign, that's one of the ways that we could definitely go about it. But then on the back end too, you're going to have more mofu and bofu moments within your funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel, if you're listening, and just making sure that you're there with that client in the consideration and the final moments of decision with your advertising campaigns as well. So when you're going from platform to platform, the value of each platform at each stage of the funnel will definitely be different. There will definitely be different KPIs. And then the process in which how you go about it needs to align internally with your culture. And of course, uh, what the executives want to see from the growth plan. Yeah, I like the point on potentially going after a smaller target on LinkedIn, because we've all been trained. Most of us have been trained as marketers at funded companies to say our TAM is huge because then you get more VC money, but it does not work for advertising because you can't saturate them. Each company will maybe see an ad once every month, for example, right? So I think that's a key point is to maybe dial that back and figure out who do you actually need to be in front because then you can also have a more targeted message that's actually going to be relevant. Yeah. When it comes to B2B and like even seeing the distribution of funding, I oftentimes feel like some people are upside down, but they have 80% of their budget towards Google. But then they also say, hey, I'm getting great upfront stats, but where's the rest of my pipeline? And then oftentimes when we're working with these clients and they're working to establish their own ABM programs, their own personalized messaging strategies, formulas, processes, not even sure how to go about it. When we get into those platforms for LinkedIn, sometimes we flip those budgets and maybe it's 20% towards Google so that we're showing up in the right moments for paid search, paid display, making sure that we're dominating the SERP. That's really the strategy that we have. On the back end for getting hyper-targeted and personalized when it gets like into LinkedIn campaigns, you can get 10x more traction and significance in terms of measuring results with your clients if you can get very personalized within niches of industry and really dialing in on the firmographic information. I would say that B2B wants to be B2C. And while B2C has all the latest technology and there are a couple years ahead in different areas, the concept is not any different. We're not selling businesses, we're selling people. So the more personalized, the more genuine, insightful, and helpful this content is for those people as you as the thought leader, the more that they're going to trust in you, the more that you will be referred by other people within the network. And then again, you will continue to dominate the rest of the SERP. So you want to show up from the Google side intent and making sure that you're there for ads, you're listed very well within listicles and other public rating systems, and that you also have those professional rating systems online all nailed down. If you can do those things, you are going to be on the first page of Google. On the second part of it too, now getting into personalized marketing attacks, you want to make sure that your targeted audience is completely set up. And when you're going into platforms like LinkedIn, again, you're not trying to get a large audience, you're trying to get very specific. So how we measure success, the expectations for success might change a little bit too, but two completely different paths, all trying to generate pipeline together as one single stroke. That is when it gets really fun. But I would say that for most companies who are looking to elevate their game, they lack that extra step. There is a gap between the ability to understand their buyer, but then also go produce that type of messaging at scale in an affordable manner. So I think that a lot of companies overly invested in some technology, they just need a trusted advisor and partner to connect the dots along that journey, along the way. And then those clients are seeing on average more than 20% growth working with Power Digital. Yeah, it's the creating content at scale is also a really interesting piece because that is one of the things with a smaller audience is you might hit frequency caps a little bit quicker. And if you're running the same ad over and over, it can get scale. So I'm curious how you think through the creative side. I guess first you're working with a lot of clients out there. What are you seeing that is actually resonating and working? 
And second, how do they actually scale content? Because most content teams have shrunk over the past year. People have been let go. Yeah, uh, 100%, especially in the B2B space, I would say that content teams have been hit the hardest. And there's been a large evolution towards more demand generation roles, more growth oriented roles, which yeah. I feel like is just covering and saying you need to wear multiple hats to be a good marketer. So in the last three to five years, marketers were supposed to be really good at crafting individual specialties of their own, very good at email marketing, very good at design, very good at creating videos. Now, all of a sudden they were supposed to be data scientists, and now we're just supposed to be growth experts. And there is no focus on creating great content or strategies. And so boutique agencies have been brought in more now more than ever, geez, to craft those stories and those narratives and companies trying to get back in touch with their own brand. It's happening every single day. I'm on calls every single day when I'm reading this and I've worked with thousands of leaders now. So when I can tell you that when we start getting into the weeds of it, a lot of content teams were definitely hit hard. So there's no way to actually create this content at scale. So you got rid of the thing that can actually fuel the engine. When I look at content strategy and I look at paid media strategies, I look at that as a two-stroke engine. But the thing that fuels the engine is the content, is the creative. You can have the best deployed and distributed campaign structures and setup, but with bad copy, bad creative, that's not personalized, that isn't high quality, there's no better way to destroy your brand faster because you'll put yourself in all the right spots with all the worst content and storytelling available. And that's one of the fastest ways to kill your pipeline. But then also you'll show up later and say, I don't understand. We're doing everything best practices. It's all scientifically laid out, but you realize that marketing isn't just science. And so getting back to that data point around data scientists, and now we're getting into shrinking content teams, like who's going to be there to tell that story? If there's no value in that, what's the purpose of another ad? So ad platforms make more money. Yay. We see more ads. Yay. And then they're also more generic and more same like than ever before as people begin to rely more on AI and forget to insert their own natural intelligence. So just a couple of my own key phrases I've developed along the way. But when I see people lack that natural intelligence inside their campaigns, it comes through because then you get an ad and you're like, why am I seeing this? Or you don't even remember seeing it at all. And I think that's the biggest detrimental piece to it is the money that gets wasted within those moments is not transparent until three, six, nine months later when you said, oh, yeah, that campaign. Yeah, I thought that worked out really great. We tried LinkedIn and it didn't work. Gee, did you look at the copy? Did you look at the creative? Did you ask people who actually came in from the ad what their thoughts were? Did you watch a hundred sales call to get their feedback? Like you probably didn't do any of those things. So when I'm thinking about it, it's people becoming over reliant on the scientific aspect of it and forgetting to create amazing content along the way. There is no way that you're going to be able to do this at scale. There is no way you're going to be able to do this on an ABM perspective at the level you should be. Now, when you're a smaller medium business, your ABM pool is definitely going to be a lot smaller. So you could still fix that and overcome some gaps. But when you're a large enterprise organization, you have a couple uh, billion dollars to your name and you're working with 15, 20 brands in your portfolio and they all have different global regional teams and everyone's responsible for their own business. That's exactly where things start to fall apart a lot. So without a dedicated content team and taking reasons out there on their own, especially for the largest brands in the world, things fall apart, translation, localization, and then also creating one unified strategy. So when I come back to it again, that two stroke engine concept, just to create a visual for the audience, if you have great content strategy backed by great paid media, then you're definitely going to see some traction in your pipeline. But the second that you don't invest your time into that content strategy is the second that the paid media piece will fall apart again. You can have a very technical setup, the best setup in the world, but without amazing content and creative to tell that story, it's not going to stick. And those ads will just fly right through your scroll and you won't be, won't be stopping as you're scrolling. And that's what we want to get to is we need to create scroll stopping content that makes me want to click on it. That makes me feel like, oh man, if I don't click this, I'm not doing my job. So that's the type of effect we want to create in those moments with our potential TAM and those people we're trying to target. Yeah. And I think a lot of it comes down to people just trying to skip a step. Like, oh, I got my campaign set up, time to scale. Rather than I got my campaign set up, let's see what message resonates. Hey, I set up my campaign, scale. I've got my TAM and I've got everything set up, but oh, my TAM is actually 500,000 people. Oh, and yeah. my best practice is set up is just an evergreen campaign that puts a very specific campaign right to the homepage of my website because I thought that would be best for everyone. There's so many common little steps that get missed in this process where people are at the high level, think that they're all set up to go but they're not targeted enough and they didn't do the homework and they're trying to overly rely on technology to cover some of those gaps for them. So without that lack of natural intelligence throughout that process, you're going to continue to see things like that. You're not going to see 
personalized landing pages. You're not going to see a TAM list that's 10 or 15,000. You're going to see it with a million people on it. Like everyone's a client is not a strategy. Everyone should see this for B2B is not going to get you pipeline and qualified leads in the door. Yeah. The other thing you mentioned there too, is a little bit on the AI side. And we've seen this in video. When AI first came out, I was like, oh shit, it's going to create videos and it's going to take us out. But then what you quickly realize is it's really good at creating videos at scale, but it is not good at actually telling a story and working on a strategy. That's what I feel like people maybe miss that, right? They, instead of viewing it as an assistant, they view it as this is my new hire. AI is going to create all my content, which probably not going to work. I know that there's people out there watching this right now that's thinking, I'm just going to go hire a bunch of AI agents from the person who's developing that in their basement right now. And I can yep. tell you that AI video and generative content at scale is starting to look more and more the same. And I know that we're promised new iterations of technology all the time. And maybe it starts to develop more individualistic personalities as you start to get a little bit further along in the tech stack, especially with GPT-5 coming and there's going to be new features and functionalities. And while I've trained ChatGPT to also follow my own personal uh, communication standards and how I talk, the tone of voice, the words in which I use, I know that at scale, someone out in the background right now, we're working with some clients that, that actually did this. Do not just go produce AI blog articles at scale. Don't just go produce AI video content at scale. People don't QA these processes at all. So you're definitely going to hurt your domain and your ranking authority if you're just putting out bad content. There's already algorithms out there that will penalize you for those things. So please don't do it if you're watching this. Someone already made this mistake again. Over a thousand different articles were created and we're trying to undo that. But the yeah. same goes for video content as well. I would say a lot of the visuals are unbelievably impressive. The way that AI can replicate human emotion and even subtle movements of turning the head, moving a mouth, now blinking eyes. The teeth are finally fixed. But when it comes to doing the storyline, that doesn't click. And that does take a ton of natural intelligence and human involvement to get those things just right. So it's not a turnkey type of situation right now for creating AI content at scale for you. Does it help in little moments? Yes. Does AI help in those moments to create an inspirational challenge to your prospect to show them where you're trying to go? Yes. But please, right now, understand AI is a co-pilot to you as a way to scale the means in which you get your job done faster and maybe produce higher quality content or overcome writer's block or visionary block. But it's not meant to replace the full job and it is not going to be for a little while. So when I'm looking at these opportunities until all of these jobs are fully automated by AI, we absolutely need people in these positions more, but how they work with AI technology ethically is exactly what's going to be most important. And when you do that correctly, then you can actually leverage AI to go generate more pipeline and use it responsibly as a B2B leader in the space. Yeah, it's the shortcuts thing again, right? Like it's just easy to jump to, this is my silver bullet that is going to make me a $100 million company and it's tricky. So one last question I want to ask before we wrap here is you're in this unique situation where you are frequently brought into companies, like brought into your clients to look at what's going on and fix things, some of these common mistakes. And I think a lot of our listeners are similar, like they've started a new job, so they've been brought into a company, but maybe it's their third, fourth job. They don't have thousands of companies they worked with. So if you were brought in-house at a SaaS company, what would be your first steps in like a demand gen type role? Oh man, one of my favorite questions, what would I do getting back into B2B SaaS and maybe technology specifically? I'll just start off and say, one, it's still my passion, make no mistake. Like I, I love technology. I host a show with 45,000 RPA and AI followers as well. Go check it out, RPA Masters, small plug. But I'm really at the end of the day, coming from that world, I have nothing but respect. My father was a CEO and we built up his technology business and had that sold. I've worked at other global technology agencies and then now I get to have the pleasure and honor to work with the world's largest technology brands as well. But if I'm walking into one of these situations, giving you my background as personal family business, medium-sized businesses, large global enterprise businesses at scale with multi-billion dollar investments, I can tell you right now that some of the areas that you get into aren't going to be as complicated as you thought. Because when you start looking at every single challenge and opportunity, there's usually a couple of commonalities within gaps. And when I talk about content strategy or when I talk about paid media strategy or how we even go about the process, I think the first thing that I would start to do is just get very clear is like, how do we run business around here? I think that is actually one of the biggest determinants 
of how any process or procedure should take place for sales and marketing. And so what I mean by that, to go a little bit more specific, is that there are high volume sales environments. There are slow sales environments with enterprise deals that can take 12 or 18 months. Like you're not going to treat those types of environments for lead generation, demand generation, demand capture, all that stuff in between. Like you're not going to treat that the same as you would versus trying to get a really qualified client but also competing against the model where you need to have a thousand phone calls every single month. So there's definitely going to like definitely be a scale of strategy. It's the first step is to be like, how do we do it around here? I need to be able to process a lot of people very quickly and qualify them and move on to the next opportunity within a week. Those marketing campaigns and strategies would be very different for generating pipeline and revenue. The second part too, is I definitely need to understand more of a gap around brand sentiment. And so when you start getting into the process, what type of model do I need to build? What do I need to be able to support? Now we start getting into like, all right, then what do people really think about us? And then I would say like one of my very first things that I recommend and I do to people coming into their new jobs and their new roles who are often being challenged with some very, very large firefights because people who left before, people who weren't qualified to do the job before, who implemented all this technology and then it didn't work and then they were laid off or they left, they have even more monumental challenges to overcome. And so you would just think walking in that brand sentiment would be great. And you actually find that it's not. And what I mean by that is when we talk about dominating the SERP, for example, you can have the best paid media campaigns and you can make sure that you rank in all the right words with your blog. But the second that a listicle or a clutch review or something like that says you're only three stars, people pay attention to that. And so what I mean by brand sentiment is that when we run our analysis and we do a uh, very in-depth performance analysis for every marketing audit that we do. Again, we have an analyst team of 25 people. They put 100 hours into these things. When you come into brand sentiment right there, it's one of the biggest killers that we ever find within campaigns because sometimes people do have things set up right. They're doing a decent job with their content and creative and how it gets out there, but they still can't glue together the gaps and they realize that they have poor reviews. And they realize that when we run this brand analysis against their ICP, and how they feel about things, the number one channel most often where people go first is search. So they're definitely going to Google to find the next opportunity and they're gonna have intent keywords and their strategies for all that. But there's no strategy for trying to undo something where you get like a two out of five on your ratings. And so the second channel that I'm leaning into is that word of mouth is more powerful than ever. They don't trust the business saying that they're good. You need other people talking about your business that it is good and that they would recommend you. So there's definitely the upfront, I need to look good and dominate the SERP part. I need to be in all the right places and all the right time. But you definitely need other people to make sure that they're rating you very well. And you have to have NPS processes in place. And you wouldn't think of that from a marketing perspective, typically. A lot of our conversations have been around, how do I generate pipeline? How do I get another ROAS point in my favor or whatever else? Your LTV CAC ratio, your CAC payback period, all this nonsense but you forgot to make sure that customers are giving you five stars. And so nothing will kill your marketing faster because you can have great marketing with poor ratings and then people just think that you're fake. So you definitely don't want to lose your brand legitimacy within the market. And so just coming in is how do we do work here with the culture and the model that we need to build that step one. Number two, and getting into that part and just making sure how do people actually feel about our brand and making sure it's five stars. That doesn't always get shown up on ROI, but dang, I'll tell you right, nothing can kill your campaigns faster. But then also like third and just getting into that point and like setting expectations for future growth, people forget to work backwards and do the modeling. So I would say is like when you work at culture and you're working at brand sentiment and now you actually start working the model backwards for where you need to go, I often find that a lot of models are misleading. And you start looking at ACV, the time to value, your funnel performance rate, you start getting into the nitty gritty stuff. I would find that most people don't understand how to work that math backwards and say, for example, just making up a little bit of math, but I need to make $10 million this year and I'm going to put $2,000 a month on Google and I'm somehow going to generate 10,000 leads for my 12% close rate and I'm going to make this money up. And it's just made up magic math. So I don't want to see that anymore. And I'm trying to warn other people too. And if you're watching this too, work it backwards. What is like in reality feasible for you to do? I would say that a lot of people who've been laid off, the teams that have been hurt the most, people who come to us looking for help and guidance and true strategy, often find themselves in these types of predicaments where an executive leader or an executive team put some boisterous results in front of people and say, go get this done. But they didn't give them the team. They didn't give them the resources. They cut headcount. They cut budgets. I watched some teams get cut by 80%. I watched budgets get cut by 80% in some instances and people being asked to do more with less. So while I'm finished my rant on this, I'll tell you that is like people aren't doing the math and working it backwards. 
and are being held to unreasonable standards, thinking that technology is going to fix that gap for them, and it's not. So the culture, brand sentiment, performance based within reality, those three key things is definitely what I would go hit on first. And that's going to cover 90, 95% of problems within businesses. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Also, it's uh, to take it one step further, I would try to look at that stuff before you accept the job. But you don't, there's certain situations where you just don't want to be there. Like you're set up for failure. And I think you called out some of the key points there. Yeah. Um, so we covered a wide range of topics today. I think we, we'll get a lot of topics here to share and get out there. But Derek, I really appreciate it. I'm sure we could keep going forever talking about this, but thank you so much for joining me. If, yeah, man, uh, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Again, always love to come back on. And again, yeah, let's do this again in the future. Cool. So Derek, thanks so much for your time. If people want to learn about you, connect, learn about Power Digital, where should they go for that? Absolutely, man. Thank you so much for having me. I can't wait to be on the next one. But if you want to connect with me, Derek Gerber on LinkedIn, please come find me. Let's get started. Let's get connected. Uh, if you want to explore a little bit more about Power Digital, just go to PowerDigital.com. Tons of resources online and be happy to walk through those things with you too. So look forward to connecting if we can. Awesome. So we'll include those links for our listeners. Derek, thanks again. All right. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Happy hunting. and I'll see you guys soon. Thanks for listening to this episode. My key takeaway is when Derek said that he commonly sees gaps in content strategy or within paid media, but then he sees this overabundance of focus on over-engineering solutions. And it's just, we've kind of been trained as marketers to track all the ROI, over-engineer everything. And sometimes it's as simple as going back to basics and realizing that the creative matters and you're marketing to emotional creatures, not logical ones. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or comment on the episode on Spotify. And as always, I'll be back next Tuesday with a new episode.